Hello. Good evening, Nileshi. Good evening, Anu. Niladri, uh, we have the CII group as well on the call. Yes, hi, Anu. Hi, hi, Nilesh. I just hi, Anuradha. How are you? Hi, Anuradha. Hi. Good to see you, ma'am. Thank you for setting this platform up. Really appreciate it. Yes, and it's a very, very important subject for discussion. Um, and Nilesh, of course, will be telling us a lot about. He's an expert of sorts, very popular also. Um, he's very popular. I, I'm a book <laughs> fan, and I think he now has a skin in the game also, huh? With the yes. new compensation laws and uh, uh, norms, etc. Absolutely. Yes. No, oh, great. Uh, I really appreciate. It. I think this is a great platform. And uh, Niladri, would you like to? Do some quick housekeeping messaging for us. Uh, 
Anup, uh, the actually the system here is we have to log out before the session starts. I think it will be managed by the host of CII because yes. we are not uh, because we will not be otherwise we'll be seen on the Hive portal. So we will be logging in from the Hive. I didn't follow. So we have to log off from here. No, me us apart from the speakers. Uh, the okay. support team which we have, we have to log out from this system. Okay, you will log off, huh? I don't have to do anything. No, it's no, only only speakers. Speakers. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, speak, normal. So, uh, anybody from CII who can just brief us on the logistics? Yes. So, basically, from the logistics perspective, uh, first of all, good afternoon, uh, Nilesh, sir. Hi, Deepak, how are you? Very well, sir. Uh, hi, Anup. Hi, Deepak. Uh, so Thank basically, you. Uh, like um, all the participants would be joining from the CII Hive platform, and this link has been shared only with the participants, uh, basically the speakers. So apart from the speakers, nobody else would be here. And then the initiation of the conversation will happen by Ms. Anuradha Selvan through welcome remarks and the intro introductory thing, and then she will hand it over to you. And like Mr. Anup, will, she will hand it over to you, and then from there on, you can take forward the discussion. Deliberation. Deepak, Deepak sir, Anuradha, ma'am, can I make a suggestion? Let's keep this thing tight. Uh, it's a digital platform. Uh, why don't you please hand it over directly? Introduce Mr. Nilesh uh, Shaji, and uh, you you know you hand it over to him. He can give it back to me, and I will introduce the panelists, and then we will jump into it. We don't have to you know do too much of handover and all. I would not encourage that. Is that okay, ma'am? Yes, of course. Super. Super. So I'll, I'll 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 quickly give about one minute of thank you, welcome, and all that. But then I'll Super. just hand over to uh, Nilesh, and then later on, uh, Anup, you can introduce it. Nilesh, sir, you can hand it over to me, and then we'll Definitely. pick it up. Super. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Sana, sir. Niladri, are we doing a live stream of this event? Yes, yes, uh, we are doing live streaming actually. So we'll also uh, just share the link within the group from March India. Okay. Nilesh and a lot of interest thus far. Huh? I hope that the number of actual participants is also that high. But I believe we have more than 500 registrations and I think there's a live stream also happening. So. So Nilesh, we are getting so used to seeing this background behind you. I've often wondered what the cabinets and the cupboards hold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I leave it to the mystery. Yes, <laughs> and to imagination. So I often wondered, you know, you've got this two small ones which we can see and this big one right behind you. <laughs> so <laughs> actually they are all of same size, but it's just the lighting effect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's been one and a half uh, half years since we have seen you yes. sitting in the same corner. If yes. if you are and it's not a virtual background, then uh, we no, no, this wonder. is the same corner where I've sat for last <laughs> one and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, in iPad, you can't create virtual background. Ah, right. Huh? No wonder you could not get the CIA background in the financial yes, market yes. summit. And now I'm so used to iPad that I can't switch to phone and log in. Yeah. Because here I, the screen is big enough. I, yeah, I right. find it difficult on iPad because the camera is on one end and you have to look at one end of the whole yes. thing. <laughs> Hi, Jyoti. Hi, Jyoti, ma'am. How are you? You're on mute, ma'am. Hi. Hi, Anup. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, sir. Jyoti, ma'am, you, you, uh, Jyoti has met uh, 
Nachiket at uh, Dilesar Nachiket leads our management library business. Does all the big IPOs as well as you know, uh, you know programs. Okay. Hi Nachiket. Hi sir. This is three fifty eight uh, Niradri uh, and. Uh, uh, Deepak sir, would, would someone do uh, some housekeeping messages as we go live? Uh, you know that we are about to start, and you know uh, this is yes. what we are here. Before going live, we will inform. Okay, super, super. So once that happens, then uh, like Anuradha ma'am can start. Welcome. So Anuradha ma'am, uh, since you are doing some opening remarks and all, I would encourage you only do some housekeeping messages as well, ma'am. Is that okay? Yeah, so I have my team who's also there. If you see another no CI logo, so that's the uh, one of the okay, team members okay. who joined from there, and we'll do the messaging from there. So it's a it's a, it's a pretty uh, everyday thing for us. So don't worry. I know, man. Huh? <laughs> for me, it's an optional job, but I know you probably do it for a living. So so. Uh, well. That was not exactly, but yes, it is. It is a regular thing for us to have webinars. So that's not the only thing we do for a living, though. No, of course, ma'am. I didn't mean it like this. Hi, Alok. How are you? Hey, hi. I'm just trying to get hi. my yeah, headphones to start working. Hi. Hi, Harsh. How are you? Hi, Harsh. Okay, I think we are live. In another 15 seconds or so, we'll be going live, please. We are live now. Good afternoon and welcome to this very interesting session on DNO and IPO risks, the imperative for independent directors. I take this opportunity to welcome Nisha, a very popular and esteemed guest today. Nilesh is the chairman of the CII National Committee on Financial Markets and also the group president and managing director of Quota Asset Management Company Limited. Um, this subject with the, the, that we have taken up today for, for discussion um, is, is an interesting subject because uh, when we talk about IPO and we talk about public, uh, you know, the initial public offering, it, it, though it presents a lot of financial benefits, but they also, uh, you know, it materially changes the company's risk profile. The entire process coming up, coming up with an IPO is a quite volatile time for a company and uh, we have Nilesh here to give us more insights on this subject and subsequently we'll be having all our speakers. Um, Anup will take that over and we have Ashok Mishra from General Antarctic and Hirsch Pais from Tri-Legal. Uh, Sanula Khan from uh, Wipro will also be joining us, but I'll leave that to later. Uh, Nilesh, I invite you to Make your opening comments and give us a more give us more insights on this whole subject we're talking about today. Thank you, Anuradha. Thank you, CII, for giving me this opportunity to talk about ESG, IPO, and independent directors. 
if we look at uh, Indian history, uh, almost all our peers have left us behind. We were equal to China in 1980. Today, they are five times bigger than us. Somewhere, we fail to encourage entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship requires capital and it requires opportunities. Let me first come to the opportunities and then come to the capital. Today, we have one of the best opportunity for India to grow. China plus one is ensuring that global manufacturers move out of China to other countries. Every single country on the world is laying out red carpet for them. But most of those countries put together does not have as big domestic market as India. To give you an example, Samsung came to India long back. It is the largest consumer durable company in India. Being an unlisted company, we don't know their financials with precision, but it's roughly about 12 to $13 billion in turnover. They make in India to sell in India. They went to Vietnam much later. Their turnover in Vietnam is upwards of $60 billion. They contribute 28% to Vietnam's GDP. Now, this is our opportunity to create many such Samsung's local company as well as global company capturing this China plus one opportunity. More importantly, in order to strengthen this opportunity, we have taken out reforms over the last 30 years. And today, stars are aligned for a great foundation for growth to accelerate. We have migrated from high inflation economy to moderate inflation economy. We have migrated from shortage of FX to plentiful of FX. We have migrated from fiscal profligacy to fiscal prudent. And even though deficit numbers are high this year and last year, thanks to pandemic, we are far more prudent compared to many of our peers. We have moved from crony capitalism to meritocracy. We are moving from infrastructure shortages to infrastructure availability across many sectors. We are moving from physical infrastructure to physical and digital infrastructure. To give you a very small example, there was a reporter of a colonial magazine which was you know, staying in India for three years, could hardly find anything worthwhile in India. Then he was shifted to France. And the first tweet he made about India was, when I want to shift money in India from one bank account to another bank account, it was instant thanks to IMPS. The damn thing take three days in France. This is the power of India's digital infrastructure. We are leapfrogging many of the developed nations. And finally, and the most important thing is government accepting that they have no business to be in business. From giving commanding heights to public sector undertakings, we are now giving importance to public-private partnership. Now, all these things have created opportunity, but India was always about not converting potential to performance consistently. There were periods when we will do and give hope to optimists that now potential will be converted to performance, and then suddenly we will take the feet from the accelerator. But with this foundation, there is huge opportunity for India to accelerate. And in order to capture these opportunities, our entrepreneurs require capital. Right now, we are seeing initial public offerings coming in quick succession. However, about 68% of total IPO raised since April 20, they have been offered for sale. They are going to the existing investors rather than going into companies. And only about 32% is going into companies. Clearly, if we want to create $5 trillion economy, this kind of mobilization 
is not going to be sufficient. Fortunately for us, the mobilization in public market to some extent is compensated by mobilization in unlisted private market. A lot of venture capital, private equity funds are coming and funding entrepreneurs' ideas. And we have seen a rapid succession of unicorns being created thanks to that private investment. At the end of the day, whether it's public investment or private investment, whether it's listed investment or unlisted investment, you will require governance, you will require environmental and social consciousness. On the environmental side, jury is yet to come out clean. I recently read a report which said that Germany spent $580 billion in the last 10 years to set up the renewable energy base. Despite that massive investment, their emissions haven't come down. And right now they are staring at energy crisis. And the only savior seems to be coal driven thermal power plants. What is in our control is the governance. If we can improve governance, I'm sure we will be able to attract capital around the, around the world. The market has already differentiated between governance, good governance versus bad governance. Time and again, badly governed companies are unable to access capital market. Their valuations have generally remained low, bearing a full blown bull market. Whereas good governance companies are able to raise capital whenever they want. They're able to generally trade at a premium valuation to broad market. And clearly good governance companies have created far more value for their investors, including promoters and minority shareholders. Fortunately, governance is not an alien concept. Tata's were torchbearer of governance for a long before, before ESG norms became famous. However, now we are seeing a momentum getting built for governance standards thanks to the intervention at law level. Regulators are also supporting good governance. Industry corporate bodies also are coming and setting up good governance guidelines. And investors are also demanding good governance. Many a times before the debate between investors and corporate board remained below the radar. It was not coming in public domain. It was more of a subtle activity. But recent incidences have shown that investors are now willing to take public battle. All these things are creating foundation where entrepreneurs with ideas will be able to get capital in public market as well as private market. They will be able to get funding in listed as well as unlisted market, and they will be able to command better valuation as long as they are following appropriate governance standards and displaying appropriate social and environmental consciousness. I believe India has a great opportunity today to capture and accelerate growth by capturing all these opportunities. And most importantly, there is capital available to the right entrepreneur if he's willing to walk on the path of environmental, social and governance standards. I hope and pray that we don't lose this opportunity like many a times in the past. We convert our potential into performance and we move upwards of $2,000 per capita GDP bracket. We close or narrow gap with China in terms of GDP. And all these things is possible by developing our capital market, by providing right funding to right entrepreneurs, and by allocating our savings in a more efficient investment. I'm sure today's panel will discuss many of these aspects. I hope and pray that CII keeps on working on ESG norms, ESG principles, ESG standards across the industry. And it acts as a bridge between issuer and investor. With this, I will end my talk and hand it over to Anup Dhingra to take it forward.
Thank you, Nileshi. Your optimism, as usual, is uh, contagious. And I really pray that, you know, what you're saying comes true in our lifetime. And uh, as they say, the risk and rewards also go hand in hand. Today, we have four very eminent personalities uh, sharing their unique vantage points on how best manage, manage companies emphasize good governance and how stakeholders, especially investors, value this thing. So we have with us Mr. Alok Mishra. He's the operating partner at General Atlantic. It's a global growth equity firm with $65 billion worth of assets uh, under management globally. And uh, they've been also a participant in the India growth journey for the last two decades. We have Harsh, uh, who's a partner and co-head uh, of corporate practice at Trilegal, uh, which is a leading law firm in capital markets, m and strategic alliances, JVs, and helping clients go public. Uh, we have Jyoti Pawar. She is the senior vice president and Gen deputy general counsel of Infosys, which, as you know, is a bellwether for Indian companies uh, from a corporate governance point of view. And it recently entered the elite club of companies with a market capitalization of $100 billion plus. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Sanaullah Khan. Uh, he's a company secretary for Wipro, which is another company known for its stellar governance and also very well known for running a very successful enterprise while keeping its management and ownership separate. So I'm privileged to share this uh, floor with all of you. And uh, let me start with Sana. Um, Sana, why don't you tell us uh, about Wipro's corporate governance journey, especially with promoters ethos of keeping ownership separate from management? You're on mute, Sana. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Hi, thank you, uh, Anu. Thank you, CIA, for uh, giving me an opportunity to uh, uh, share some thoughts here. Uh, Dilesh has highlighted uh, very well how important it is uh, to have the higher standards of governance and how it will attract investment and uh, how the valuation of the company uh, improves with the standards of governance. So uh, at Wipro, yes, uh, we, we have been uh, uh, at the top of this uh, highest governance standard. And uh, uh, globally, it's, it's proven that high standards of governance attract investment at, at a low cost. And uh, we are also listed on the New York Stock Exchange apart from uh, the BSE and NSE. So we, we do comply with uh, both the Indian regulations as well as the uh, New York Stock Exchange regulations and the SEC regulations from a uh, corporate governance standpoint. Uh, but at Wipro, uh, to be honest, more than the regulatory requirements, a lot of things that we do and uh, are are more mostly voluntary in nature. Uh, we do things uh, when uh, even though they're not regulated. And uh, like for example, uh, if you look at our board composition itself. Uh, if the board is required to be composed with 50% uh, of independent directors, we have much more than that number. We are close to 70%. Um, a large part of uh, Vipro's shareholding is also uh, with the philanthropy, and uh, that actually makes it more important for us uh, uh, to kind of maintain high standards of governance and uh, uh, every, every rupee of profit that we earn, uh, about 60 to 70% of that goes into philanthropy. So we take pride in that. Uh, the tone at the top is very, very clear to maintain highest and uh, highest standards of governance and ethics. There's absolutely no compromise there, uh, be it the promoter or, or the board. Uh, a lot of things that we do, we do voluntarily, even though the regulation don't uh, require us to do. Um, corporates must deliver this message that integrity and ethical values uh, cannot be compromised and uh, customers, uh, associates and employees must receive and understand uh, the same message. Uh, and it's very clear at Wipro uh, that we demonstrate this through the, our words and actions and we, we are committed to very, very high values of ethical standards. Um, at Wipro, if you look at, if I, if I have to talk a little bit about the journey of, um, uh, of corporate governance, it's it's not a uh, one time action or it's it's not something that we do today and we don't do tomorrow i think it's a continuous process wipro has evolved over a period of time uh, it's a pre independence uh, existing company so 1945 is when the company was incorporated and uh, the public issue of the company happened in the year 1946 so it's it's like a journey from there and how we evolved, how we uh, maintained higher standards of governance, how we maintained our brand, uh, 
uh, I think the promoter has put in a lot of effort here. And like I said earlier, the tone at the top is very, very clear. Uh, Vipro is uh, one of the first companies to set up an audit committee in the year 1986. And even the composition of the audit committee today is 100% uh, independent directors. It's not just 50% uh, like the requirement as per the SEBI regulation sees. Uh, Wipro has also won uh, the Alexander Hamilton Gold Award for Excellence in Investor Relations way back in the year 1998. In the year 2000, we have set up a US GAAP audit. Uh, then we have also won an international award for institution uh, from Institute of Auditors in the USA. So there's a lot of things that happened and uh, recently Wipro uh, has been awarded from the year 2012 onwards the most world's most ethical company uh, which which is an yearly award and this is one uh, now for, uh, for the last nine years so it's it's a journey and uh, and the, the governance standards are very very high uh, for someone who's working here from the last four five six years i can understand and tell you that uh, uh, it's it's not just uh, lip service and it's a lot goes into this in terms of the thought process and then in terms of how we react to situations how we make our disclosures uh, for the investors so a lot of things are, are going uh, well for wipro well uh, your question on ownership separate from uh, the management that's always been the case here uh, there is a professional ceo who runs the organization the management team is built around him uh, who's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the company so ownership is kept separate uh, and there's an arm's length maintained at the same time. Board level supervision is, is also there where we have well uh, uh, defined or uh, well respected board members uh, out of nine directors, seven, uh, six are independent today uh, with two women directors. So I think it's, 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 it's a well governed company uh, and uh, I'll take a pause uh, on out here. No, absolutely. That that does help us with the secret sauce. And my next question to you, Jyoti, is uh, tell us about Infosys's corporate governance approach. I know your founding fathers have always believed that when in doubt, disclose. But is there more that makes Infosys a beacon of good governance, like Sana said? Thanks, Anup. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think Infosys founded in 1998. Very strong foundation of corporate governance, uh, you know, and over the years, the leadership that joined then built on it, and you know, it's a continuous process. So, I mean, I think governance is about maximizing, uh, you know, the shareholder value legally, ethically, and sustainably. So, sustainably is the key word over here, right? That you have to build on something and sustain something. So various things really go into uh, maintaining that and what, what your framework is, is the most important things and I'll have touched on that also. So for, for us, I think we have a failed framework is built around values, which is values of sea life as we call them, which is effectively client value, a leadership by example, integrity, transparency, excellence and fairness. So that's, that's what our overall principle or the guiding force is and all our you know, governance is revolving around these. Um, uh, you know, we have won, I think, very recently in the past year, I'm just talking about the recent awards, many awards around corporate governance per se. We've won one, I think, even the latest one from Etisphere recently on this. So, you know, like you started by saying that both companies are recognized for their governance and rightly so. Uh, so apart from, you know, what our ethos or beliefs are, I think what is very important for a good corporate governance is a very good board composition. And we do take great pride in the board composition that we have. Uh, you know, everyone's aware we have a very diverse board, uh, very, very good, eminent personalities, well respected, credible uh, board partners from uh, different walks of life. Uh, there is diversity in culture, there's diversity in um, industry, geography, ethnicity. I think it's all there. Uh, what and how we do it in a very, very, you know, little snapshot so that I give opportunity to all the others also to speak is basically at the top you have the board which has various committees under it. So you have the compliance, you have audit, you have risk and the usual that, you know, various committees are there. But I think what really stands out over and above that is the subcommittees that are then formed uh, within uh, the company to make sure that each of the mandates that the board gives you 
uh, is then followed through uh, and a process or a map or a progress sheet is sort of put into place and everything is monitored at the top management level. Uh, so it's not that, you know, the board meeting comes up and there's a buzz around it. I think there's a buzz through the year. There's so much of a buzz that we have this habit of self audit, right? So the legal department itself, my own department has audits on our own self. We've got a special audit team within the legal team, which audits uh, things that we believe will come up in the future and as risks. So we make sure that we've got all of that in place. We have a disclosure committee, uh, which is at the top again, where different CEOs of different businesses across different countries are expected to disclose what they believe could be issues. Um, and so that's, that's a very fair opportunity given to everybody to come forth and talk about whatever you know, the issues are so that we can solve them. Um, and if there's anything that is material, then it's further taken up to the board. Uh, additionally, I think the last point really is going to be on subsidiary governance, given that we have so many subsidiaries and so many companies that you're probably listening in or otherwise are always, uh, you know, uh, dealing with subsidiaries also. So we have a very strong subsidiary governance process that we've uh, revamped and we look at revamping almost every year, all the processes, but this one in specific this year because there have been a fair amount of you know acquisitions etc and we believe that that is important so uh, we've mo made sure that we have understood the differences in the businesses of the subsidies versus us and not sort of done a blanket copy everything infosys does because that's not practical but how do we then safeguard with certain non-negotiables for the subsidies so that they will definitely follow the basic guidelines i think that's how i think in a snapshot um, we've uh, we are managing our subsidiary governance as well as our oh. That's pretty useful. And Jyoti, I totally can agree with you. Huh? Always buzz when I come and visit you. Huh? Yes. So, Alok, let me ask you this uh, follow-on question. I've known you as a CFO for some of the most progressive firms in India and now as a large investment, investing partner. Uh, what do you look for while, while investing? And does governance or quality of management play a, play a part in your investment decisions? In fact, it's the most important part of the investment decision because fundamentally GA globally uh, and definitely in India as well, is a growth equity investor. So we take minority positions. We are not majority or control investors. We're not buyout, late stage, leverage kind of investors. Our ethos is fundamentally as a minority growth stage investor. And we may have, I would say, at best a dozen companies around the world. We have about 165, 170 portfolio companies around the world. Maybe at best a dozen would be control investments because of certain historical reasons. I think we have only one in India and uh, rest of them are all minority growth investments. So for us, uh, fundamentally, we are backing a founder or a founding team or a management team. Uh, so for us, that becomes the most important. Secondly, we are not there inside the company, nor do we put our people there to run it. So for us, uh, the company has to have the highest quality of governance for it to be uh, to make sense to all stakeholders, including us. So in protecting our investment, enhancing our investment, making sure the right management decisions are made. And that governance obviously starts with having the right board. So in 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 many cases, you will find that you know investors want. Uh, veto rights or affirmative vote rights and those kind of things. We took a slightly different uh, approach right from the beginning. And when I say beginning, this particular team has been together since 2013. Uh, and you know, we kind of uh, rebuilt the team in early 2013. I joined the firm around middle of that year, where we took an approach that we will try and use governance as a means of uh, protecting investor rights and all stakeholder rights. So look at all stakeholders equally, not just give one investor a veto. Uh, you may have certain rights which are more governance related or uh, to protect your investment, protective rights. But by and large, we said, let the board uh, run the company, let the board decide and take the decisions and constitute the board. So even in, in in fact, the second investment we made was a IT company in 2014. It was a private limited company. It did not need independent directors, yet we had independent directors uh, on the board. And we constituted the committees. We had an audit committee, we had a finance committee, we had 
uh, you know, the, the CSR committee, uh, and we, we ran, we are NRC also, and we ran the company as if it were a public company with independent directors, even though it wasn't required. Uh, so we've used actually governance as a means of uh, shareholder value enhancement and made sure that we have the right man. We, and this is my right management team that we back. Now we usually would look to help that management team build uh, and supplement in terms of additional roles and things like that. You know, very often one of the first things we are required to do is help the company by, uh, recruit a CFO or a company secretary because those are one finds in 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 early stage companies um, probably the some of the neglected roles. Everybody is very more focused on the technology or the marketing or the sales part of it. Sometimes finance, legal, and all are are uh, uh, you know play a, a secondary role. But when we come in, we try and enhance that and make sure that they have a seat at the at the board uh, and and they are given the due prominence because that is the best way of protecting everybody's interest you know having the right uh, statutory auditors bringing in an internal audit requirement even though uh, it may not be required by law we uh, we enforce upon people or we impress upon them rather that what is the benefit of having good internal systems, processes, controls, audits, all of that. Uh, and that's been really, really beneficial for us uh, across the board. And we found that in general, people, the company processes have improved. And ultimately, when the company grows, it has to grow with discipline. So there has to be the infrastructure. Otherwise, some of that uh, growth may not be sustainable. So we impress upon the founders or the, uh, the promoters that it is important to have all these processes in place so that the growth is in a disciplined manner and it is sustainable. So everybody is pretty much uh, uh, what we found is that once you explain the logic, uh, it's usually accepted. Uh, equally, bringing in the right diversity, bringing in uh, the right mix of people, both in management as well as on the board, not just the board, but also in the management, having the right uh, leaders. Uh, with with the diversity, religious, ethnic, uh, gender, all of that, uh, and that we found always has added value and ultimately leads to a better better value for the investor as well. And you're, it's all about building the company, helping it grow, and with the ultimate objective of saying, you know, you're able to take that company public. Makes sense, Alok, and I do remember that 2014 example that you were mentioning. So. Harsh, my next question to you is that uh, while institutional investors value this thing, like we heard from Alok, uh, how about you know your advice to clients which are looking to go public? Uh, is good governance, including disclosure mechanisms, a luxury or a necessity? And what are those minimum set of things that you would encourage your clients to adopt? Your mute, Harsh. Uh, Anup, thanks for setting the stage. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be contributing to this discussion. Um, like uh, like you, uh, we can't take credit for our clients' businesses uh, because they have built them. Uh, but we do have a role in ad providing advice and assistance. Um, and in a sense, uh, when we do that, just like yourself, we also advise our clients on risk. And what their approach should be uh, to risk, in particular, legal and regulatory risk, but for uh, you know, other things. Uh, as uh, Mr. Nilesh Shah said, there is a unique uh, alignment of opportunity, capability, and capital at this time. Um, and we have the benefit of. Uh, of helping our clients navigate the opportunities that they see uh, and make the choices that they make in this environment. So whether it's a it's a public offer, uh, like you just mentioned, or it's an acquisition, or it's some other kind of transaction, uh, increasingly, and it has been so for a while, the, the clients we work with are have become increasingly focused in this, and they have been many of them for uh, 
you know, as was mentioned earlier on the call for many years, in some many in some cases decades. Uh, I think what has gradually now become the consensus view um, is that strong governance and ESG standards also contribute uh, as as Alok just said to valuations. Uh, so the advice that we give our clients uh, is. Uh, and I won't get into the details. There are many aspects of different kinds of uh, transactions, which are you know for which different things are relevant. Uh, but the bottom line is, have you set up the systems in place whereby governance is not the exception, uh, but it is the norm? Uh, in other words, it should not require active. Or positive action to ensure governance, although governance is something to pay attention through to continuously. Uh, but partly the advice that we give is that you cannot simply rely on those positive actions taking place all the time, although you should take those actions, but you need to have systems and governance policies in place where that gets attention. Uh, and the you know independent directors, uh, compliance policies, all of these contribute to that. Uh, and to to sum up, uh, as 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 someone has said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, and the real the hallmark which both internal governance mechanisms uh, look to achieve, as well as uh, external advice, is geared to. Uh, uh, advice is that the way uh, any business goes about its activities or its investments is such is it should be such that if everything was known and disclosed to everyone, uh, it would be fully justifiable. Uh, and that is the advantage of having whether it's internal audits or independent directors uh, or uh, other such mechanisms because. These are all different gatekeepers who ensure that choices and decisions have to be justifiable and they have to be justified. And that is uh, an important aspect of governance. Uh, so I think without getting into aspects that are peculiar to various kinds of, 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 of matters, I would say that's probably the, those are the two hallmarks. Uh, number one, do you have systems in place which promote compliance and do not require active intervention just to secure compliance? And number two, are those systems ensuring that all decisions are actually fully justifiable, assuming they were fully known to the whole world? Uh, I so agree, Harsha. And unfortunately, in the real world, justifiable in hindsight. So totally get yes. it. Huh? Totally get it. Sana, sir, my next question to you. Uh, your firm has really accelerated both organic and inorganic growth in the last few quarters. So many congratulations on that. But how do you view retention of management, which you mentioned is key, board diversity, company culture while integrating? I think Jyoti also touched upon that thing. And uh, in, in words of what Jyoti was saying, what are those minimum no compromise items that you prescribe? And what are the things that you can live with, you know, while respecting company culture? Yeah, so I don't last uh, few quarters have been good for us, uh, but um, we are too close to the quarter end. I think I may not be able to comment much. We are in a, we are in a silent period, but yes, uh, last few quarters have been good. And uh, of course, we have still a lot to catch up. As you know, there was a CEO change that has happened uh, a year back uh, and also a, a strategy has changed and when, when the CEO change happens, a lot of uh, leadership roles also keep changing. Uh, there will be new leaders who will be emerging, new leaders who will be hired uh, from the market, etc. But one thing that hasn't changed is the value system and uh, and uh, Theory, who's our CEO, has been very, very clear and vocal about it that uh, Wipro is known for its own in standards, Wipro is known for its value system. and. So that remains constant and probably we'll have to see uh, if we can take it to the next level, uh, if at all we need to take it. 
is absolutely no compromise on that in terms of the values and ethics and uh, governance standards of the company. Uh, and and uh, uh, one other interesting thing that has happened in the last about a year, year and a half is that our, uh, our chairman now, Mr. Rishad Premji, has uh, taken up this task of uh, 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 talking about the five habits he would like to see in every Vipraite. Uh, when when I see uh, when I say five habits, he has actually articulated and came out with uh, five simple uh, habits that every Viproite need to have. Uh, being respectful uh, is number one. Uh, that is how how you treat others uh, within and outside of the organization. Being responsive, uh, how do you react to a situation and how do you uh, take care of uh, a situation or your own. Uh, uh, team members, your own uh, customers, your associates, everyone. Always communicating. Uh, surprise is the last thing that we would like to see. Uh, demonstrating stewardship or the ownership. That's the fourth one and building trust. So these five habits, uh, he has personally met uh, over 17,000 employees uh, during the last financial years. He has done about 75 plus sessions and uh, to talk about this and how important it is uh, for the organization to, to kind of uh, inculcate these uh, these five habits within every way provide. So uh, there's a lot that has happened. There's a lot that has gone into this uh, this process of building a, a sort of uh, uh, environment or a culture. And the culture is nothing but its employees and pandemic has only made it uh, tougher for all of us. Uh, you also know and we have all seen that. But this continuous communication and talking about these five habits and tone at the top has, has really helped us. The other point you raised is on uh, board diversity. Uh, I think we have a very uh, clearly articulated policy on uh, board diversity. Uh, no discrimination on, on color, race, and uh, nationality or uh, gender. And uh, we, if you look at our board today, we have about uh, nine uh, directors. Uh, out of them, three are... Uh, uh, U.S. nationals and uh, one our CEO is from Europe and uh, we also have two women directors. So I think it's well represented. It's a, the great amount of diversity, geo representation at the same time expertise. We have very uh, clearly articulated policy on uh, on who should be on the board. What is the skill sets that are required to be on the board? Where whether we are ticking all those boxes when we are appointing new board members. Uh, it's not just business, it's just uh, not just audit and accounting experience. So it, it kind of the entire skill set and has been uh, uh, defined by the Norm and Rem committee and uh, Norm and Rem committee from time to time looks at uh, candidates and profiles while appointing and what is that that's missing uh, in a board. So a, a lot goes into that, a lot of thought process goes into that and uh, Rishad and Mr. Premji, uh, they, they drive this very, very uh, clearly. Uh, at the same time, we also have an independent norm and rem committee which takes care of the board diversity. Uh, I hope I covered your question, if there is anything. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Sana sir. And uh, Jyoti, I just wanted to ask you a follow-on question. Like Sana sir mentioned, employees are the key. So between Infosys and Wipro, you probably employ half a billion people. Huh? And uh, can you share some best practices on managing employment related issues, especially with employee retention across various sectors? You're in mute, Jyoti. Such a classic uh, <laughs> example. Every time someone gives me a dollar for saying you're on mute, I would have been a millionaire thus far. Huh? Yeah, I know, I know. No, so so I know. I mean, to your point on retention, if I take a step back on attrition, it's like for the you know tech companies, it's it's really unreal what's happening. And in the legal department, I mean, we believe we lose our lawyers to uh, to law firms, and the law firms believe we lose they they lose it to corporates. So I'm not so sure. I think they're all joining insurance, right? Uh, you, you can comment on that. But that aside, if I look at uh, retention, so I mean, you know, I think one of the things that really strikes me uh, at Infosys is the sheer flexibility that we offer our employees like nine days work from home irrespective this is before covid also right uh, it, it's it's very very easy for employees to work uh, you know uh, at enforces it's very flexible hours etc it doesn't matter i mean wherever you are as long as you deliver i think that's very important as a retention strategy our entire employee say framework is built on you know say connect 
you know, how do we connect with our employees? What is our communication? And that's a constant thing. How do we collaborate with them? How do we celebrate with them? How do we care for our employees? What is the culture? Is it of respect? Is it a is a no tolerance to integrity or compliance issues? So I think all of this creates a certain culture, and all of this on on a campus, which I I take great pride in, you know, being a part of, which has got every facility that you can think of, state of the art sports, medical. I mean, you name it, it's there. And irrespective of COVID, I think we had the culture of celebrating concerts. We had the Infocian Petit Day, which is for children. About 16,000 children participated, right? So we had, uh, you know, different concerts, different whatever talent the kids had. And it was all there on a particular day. All of this, I think, does really help employees to belong uh, and feel that they are a part of this Infosys community. Um, I think, you know, all of this aside, I think this is almost like a hygiene factor, which Infosys offers and, you know, you join. But at the end of the day, the employee wants to also understand the career path, right? So I think there are two or three key things. One is, do I have, do I understand as an employee, what is the next step for me? What is growth? What does growth mean for me? So when the company says, navigate your next, what is my navigation? What's my navigate next, you know, in, in my personal career? Uh, and how do I go about this path? That's the other one. And then, of course, the third one is how do I then compare, uh, you know, my contributions versus my remuneration and the market? So it's a combination of all of this. And I think having recognized all of this, it was recently covered also in the media that we have looked at revamping and benchmarking various segments of employees to see what is it and where do we stand. Um, so, uh, special bonus incentives have been given very recently for high performers. We've also raised the bar in terms of, uh, you know, remuneration for the others. We are looking at a very formal, or rather it's ongoing, a very formal mentoring process where an, a very senior mentor is assigned, helps you understand the company better, helps you understand your prospects better. There are courses in Stanford or in various other universities where employees can reskill, upskill. Uh, I think these are all very important uh, aspects. And the most important, Anup, I just you know end with this one is is I think trust, uh, some sort of a continuous transparency, communication. If there's something covered in the newspaper, whether it's in India or any other part of the world, it's important that employees are immediately told that here's where we are on that particular aspect, right? So very clear communication on growth, on issues um, is important. We also have the Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee, which is, I think, very, very essential, a compliance committee, a complaints committee. And we have something called the HAIL, which is Health Assessment Lifestyle Enrichment, which takes care of, you know, mental issues or emotional stability issues, or, and a lot of it really helped during COVID time, right? You know that, that, that these things are very important. I think all of this put together, helping employees tran you know, transform their skills while the company transforms into, goes through this entire digital transformation. I think these are very important retention strategies, which we have, some which we already have, and some which we have now implemented in the very recent past. Understood. And every time you let me stay on your campus, I, my first preference is to stay on your campus. I, I really, really like it over there. Uh, Alok, uh, over to you. You know, you have investments in so many digital economy firms. Do all of them have to make money on day one? And how patient are you if the company and its management is fundamentally good? Are there any specific skill sets you're looking at or a mix you're looking at while crystallizing management structures, uh, even though, like you mentioned, you have minority investments? So just to give you an example of how patient our money can be, uh, we invested in the National Stock Exchange in 2007 March. We exited last year in December. So 13 and a half years, I think uh, there'll be very few uh, financial investors or private equity investors who've been invested for that long. Our structure is such that we don't have classical funds and therefore we don't have the classical end of fund life issues. So our money is relatively evergreen. No money is evergreen, right? Every investor wants a return. They want their money back at some point. But I guess our money is, uh, our, our investments can be a lot more long term, right? So a lot of our uh, investments in India have been, uh, we've been invested in uh, one of the analytics companies here in Bangalore. We've been invested now for almost 11 years. So 
uh, 10 and a half years that we've been invested there. So it, it really depends. I mean, we are in it for the long term and uh, it depends on how long the company needs. Does the company need to make profit on day one? Not necessarily. Uh, as long as there is a good visibility to profit. What we look for is really good unit economics. That means at the at the margin or at a contribution level, are you making money? And then you may be reinvesting some of that in, let's say, IPL advertisements like a couple of our portfolio companies do or you know, some other uh, form of investment in building infrastructure, building your, uh, expanding your uh, sales network, uh, growing your uh, sales footprint across uh, different geographies, you're reinvesting that for the future and for the growth, that is absolutely fine. What we would look for is fundamental unit economics. As long as that is sound, then the rest is uh, easily manageable. So some of the investments we made, uh, I remember uh, one of our investments was recently in the news because we've signed an agreement uh, for for the exit, uh, when we invested in 2015, it was highly profitable even then. It continues to be as profitable, if not more, today, and it has grown, you know, several uh, fold from the time we invested. So, uh, it's not really about being profitable on day one, as long as the unit economics are sound, and as long as the investments are made in a sensible and controlled manner. At some point in time. Uh, they will all be, uh, you know, they will all, they should all uh, be profitable barring, you know, some unforeseen, they've been delays. For example, we have a, a women's wear, uh, women's fashion uh, company. Uh, when we invested in 2013 for the next couple of years, it grew fantastically. It was making huge profits but for the last year and a half. I mean, till about July from around, I would say, March, April last year till July, it went through a really tough time, except briefly in Jan, Feb, you know, in between the two waves, it kind of recovered a little bit, then again got hit by the second wave. So retail in general got very badly hit. We have a restaurant company, they got badly hit, but all of them have sound unit economics. So the moment uh, normalcy, uh, whatever that form, uh, whatever form it may take, uh, you know, I've heard the new normal like you've, said uh, you're on mute so many times. I've heard the new normal so many times. I would also be a millionaire if I got a dollar for each time. So uh, no one knows what that is, but whatever it may be, all of these guys, if you have your uh, fundamentals in place, it's all, uh, it'll all work out uh, in, in the long term. And like I said, we're all long term investors. The on, on your point on skills and things, it's really about fit for purpose, uh, the way we look at it. There's no need to take a cannon to shoot a fly. So you want to have a solution that uh, is of the right size uh, and the right, uh, I would say, makeup uh, for what the problem is at hand. It is not that uh, very often, you know, we're, when we're looking for a CFO of a company, uh, a company may be, you know, $100, $120 million of top line. And they want somebody who's uh, already done a IPO. I say, if the person has already done an IPO, why would they come and join you, right? So you have to find somebody who may have been, you know, part of the IPO team, but now has an opportunity of proving his or her own worth and and doing all of that. So that's how you look for a lot of the diversity in the team: people of diverse <laughs> backgrounds, experience, different industries. So uh, initially, we used to always think that as long as uh, um, the, the person is from the same industry, it's a huge advantage. But that's not always the case, right? It depends a lot on the individual. Uh, people who may come from a different industry altogether uh, may still do a great job uh, because some fundamental principles are the same across uh, industries. And it also depends on that uh, individual's uh, enthusiasm, their in individual's energy level, and the ability to you know, roll up their sleeves and 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 get to work. So, uh, you know, on the profit question, like I said, it's it's not that they will be profitable on day one. They just have to have, we just have some kind of a plan or a visibility that they will become profitable, and the building blocks of that profitability have to be there, which is really what I just talked about the unit economics. 
and like you said, people are the key. So, so my next question is actually to Harsh. Uh, on the people side, are the regulations related to independent I think directors? Harsh, uh, lost his Harsh. connection, maybe. Harsh. Oh, we lost Harsh. Yeah, we so lost. I, I saw his uh, video froze, and then he dropped. So maybe he had a. Uh, yeah. So 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 Alok, let's do one thing. While we get Harsh back, let me ask you another question. Uh, we are all aware right. of all of your patient money as well as your string of successful investments. Tell us I some something about your failure. Tell us something I about failures. Much too soon. <laughs> no, 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 no. But tell us something about failures also. Mm -hmm. Especially some key takeaways and learnings that you would yeah, like to share made, with our audience. We've made what close to 20 investments in India over the last 20 years. Um oh, Harsh is back. Uh, you want me to go ahead or you want to no no go ahead, Alok. Huh? Let's hear from you. So yeah, we've 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 actually uh, we've had a couple of issues and I think one of the things, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll relate a little anecdote and that'll help relate. Uh, about two years into my, uh, as you know, I don't come from a PE background. I was an operating CFO, you know, Indian listed company, US listed company. Uh, this job dropped into my lap. I became a PE guy by accident uh, and by destiny, I suppose. And about two years into my job here, one of the big four partners who does a lot of diligence work for us asked me, so look, what have you learned in your two years? So I said, I've learned two things for sure in two years. Number one, PE guys don't know how to run companies. So we should stay out of people's hair, get the right people, help them, and let them run the company. We shouldn't be getting into the company and running it for them. Because most of us, I, mean, I may be a slight exception, but most people are astute investors, may not be necessarily the best operators. That is the first one. The second learning I said was, we have a great legal system, we have rule of law, we have all of that. But end of the day, as a minority investor, and this is why I, I realized why a lot of people choose to be control or majority investors, as a minority investor, it really boils down to partner selection. How do you, dis, how do you choose who you're gonna partner with and who you're gonna invest in? So which is, relates me back to the first question that you asked. That is why that management team becomes really, really critical. And the only time, and I would say in our history, we probably had one and a half kind of misses. And on in both of both uh, instances, it was really about not choosing the right person, not having the right, I would say, checks and balances and controls or the right governance, just trusting the person. And, uh, you know, in, in one case, they really let all there were two investors sitting there uh they there was a big fraud inside the company they had siphoned out funds and all of that and by the time and, and this thing blew within about a month of my joining uh so most of it had already happened and then we were trying to clean it up uh we're still in litigation with that company the company is the last i checked with council they were kind of into the liquidation process but that is also stalled for the last year and a half because there's no because of COVID. But uh, you know, the lesson learned there is really be very, but don't get seduced just by the spreadsheet models and all of that. End of the day, you're investing behind people, especially as a minority investor. You have to be very, very clear and careful who you partner with, uh, who do you invest behind, and how do you manage the governance so that you keep a track. So, for example, in this company, we had statutory audit. We had a big four auditor. Uh, in fact, they are the ones who uh, discovered the, the problem in the first place. But that was a once a year kind of event. Uh, there was no real internal audit kind of process. There weren't regular reviews and things that we were doing. So we trusted that person. The business was seemingly doing very well. But end of the day, you figured that there was a lot of fraud uh, going on in there and they, they were all cooked numbers that were being published. So I think that's why thereafter almost every company uh, we have a good internal audit process and uh, we also uh, make sure that we do a good diligence not just on the company and its financials and the legal and the statutory aspects but also on the people that we're going to back. So we talk to other people they have worked with. We talk to other investors they may have worked with to see were they you know, good partners in business. Uh, and we do a lot of that 
diligence at a personal level before we invest. And equally, I'm sure they do the diligence on us to say, are these guys uh, good investors? So. I, I totally get it. I totally get it, Alok. And, and you're right. I think people make it or break it. So, Sarasa, let me ask you this thing. Huh? On the people side, sometimes people do get disillusioned also. Huh? Uh, so, what happens if there's employment litigation, frivolous or otherwise? What's your approach? And do you feel there are some geographies which are hot spots for these kind of, you know, items? And other thing is, in your experience, does insurance play any kind of, you know, role in any of these uh, financial reimbursements or anything else? Yeah, sure. Uh, so litigation has become uh, the new normal, if I have to use that word again, uh, like Alok is saying. Uh, especially the bigger you are, probably the the more will be uh, you will be targeted uh, both uh, from external as well as external uh, stakeholders. Uh, but having said that, yes, uh, I think what's important is that I'll take a step back. I think if you're hiring process, it all starts with the hiring process. If you're hiring the right people uh, who fit into uh, your thought process, who fit into your value system, who fit into your culture, uh, the organization culture, and when you when you also uh, uh, look at these five habits that we are talking about. I think, I think if you have a more streamlined uh, uh, process of hiring uh, and you're choosing your employees well, uh, who fit into your organization culture, it's it's that much easier for you to to kind of manage those employees and their expectations. Uh, so even our uh, talent review processes today, uh, uh, where we talk about uh, High performance culture. One, uh, it, it's not just about uh, whether you're meeting your targets, whether you are, uh, uh, you know, able to deliver your KPIs or uh, KRAs, whatever you call them. Uh, it's beyond that. It's 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 like how you are also inculcating those five habits. You will also be rated on those five habits uh, on your quarterly appraisals in terms of uh, whether you are living up to those five habits the organization wants you to uh, wants to see in you. Uh, are you leading a team uh, with those five habits? So I think there is a lot more thought process that has gone into it, which I'm sure is helping us. But having said that, yes, there is there is uh, litigation, there is employee litigation, there is uh, vendor litigation, there is client litigation that's always there, and uh, insurance does protect us from all of these litigations. I think what's also important is that uh, how we are present in uh, Wipro is present in 50 plus countries. So are you complying with the law of the land? The, the law of the land is different and there is absolutely no compromise there. Uh, and whether your employment policies are fair and reasonable and uh, whether are they questionable? How are the regulators looking at you? How are the regulators looking at your immigration policies? There's a, lo a lot of, um, uh, you know, exercise needs to be done and uh, we, we are there and uh, we are being present for more than 75 years. We uh, we know our trade and we know where the bottlenecks are, where the risks are, and uh, we are trying to minimize those uh, and trying to do our best. Frivolous litigation again is 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 a major problem. Uh, I'm sure Jyoti can talk more about it. Uh, and uh, uh, the problem is that how do you handle it and whether you will give in, whether you will settle, or you will because the the litigation costs are quite high in some of the geographies, particularly in the US. If you go to a California state, uh, if you look at a VJR litigation, you know, how expensive it is, you know. So whether you will fight out, knowing that it's a frivolous litigation, whether you would like to fight it out or whether you would like to settle the matter, what will be the repercussions of settling that matter? You know, all these things, they, they, they differ from uh, case to case, I would say. Uh, but experience comes handy. We get the counsel of external counsels like uh, uh, like try legal, etc., and particularly from the other geographies, uh, before we take a final decision in terms of how do we go about it. Uh, insurance does play a large role. Uh, it's 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 not a. Uh, I would say it is it is more of a uh, more of something where the insurer also comes and shares some of his experiences when it, when it is a large litigation. Uh, some of his experiences and Marsh pitches in and Marsh tells us as to whether how do we go about it, who's the right lawyer, etc. in those geographies when we start, when we are facing some of these litigations. Insurers do play a role there, but at the same time, uh, uh, we as an organization always behave as a, like a prudent uninsured uh, rather than an insured, where it will help us uh, take the right decision and the right call. 
just because there is an insurance, you don't go and settle a matter and try and claim the insurance. That's not the approach we have. Uh, the other thing that we also do is proactively, insurers don't like surprises. So we, we keep uh, the insurers informed in terms of whenever there is an event happening, even before it turns into a litigation. So how do you manage your litigation at various stages and how do you keep your insurers, your external counsels involved? All of that uh, does play a role. No, appreciate that, uh, uh, Sana sir. So, so you're right on cue, huh? Jyoti. I I think apart from people and and I know you do a lot to keep people happy. There's a lot of significant uptake in shareholder and regulatory activism also. So, uh, do directors bother about insurance or any of these things? Are they happy with company indemnification? Uh, do you think a good directors and insurance program is helpful in attracting and retailing board talent and diversity? And you know, if yes, what do, what do directors look specifically uh, from all of these things? So I think you know, shareholder activism, you know, as a term, I think it's it's rising globally, uh, probably more outside, and maybe some early signs noticed in India also. Uh, India today is at a stage where we do have an opportunity to learn from best practices of other countries, right? I haven't seen a lot of this happening everywhere. Uh, and uh, the important thing, you know, like most of us have spoken today is, you know, important to continue having that corporate governance and insurance is, does not make up for it. And uh, Anub, you know how difficult it is to get uh, the money back from insurers also. So that aside, coming back to your question on, uh, you know, whether uh, directors are happy with what is there already or are they asking for more etc i think there is always a mix uh, you know given that in any global company or any multinational where there is a mix of subsidies etc there are some directors who are happy with the coverage that the parent has there are some who are not happy and want an additional coverage uh, there are some directors on the board who will probably be happy with uh, what is there and the others may ask to do a full you know, exercise to see, and, and different things determine this, right? Uh, it's how the market is, how the environment is, what kind of claims have happened in the market, in the industry, or, you know, and some advice from you, yourself, your, you know, brokers, insurances. Uh, I think all of this drives the decision on whether a director wants us to in increase the, uh, you know, coverage or to maintain the coverage. Uh, I think very various factors go into it. But, um, you know, your, your question on whether uh, they, are they uh, are they happy? I think one of the things that you that you want to know, I think, you know, DNO insurance is extremely important. Uh, everybody, every director, you know, especially after the change in companies act, various regulatory, uh, you know, uh, pressures that have been put on uh, independent directors or directors, even for that matter, management of a company, it becomes imperative on the person for their own personal and professional protection to definitely have uh, a DNO insurance and to sort of join a company which has a solid DNO program. So um, I don't know if that answers all your questions, but uh, yes, I think it is important to have it. It's important to read for a director to ask for a copy of it before they before they accept the uh, you know independent directorship to read and see whether they have protection to see if they have protection after they are uh, they retire from that position of uh, director because all of this is important right eventually it's a uh, litigations are not easy and uh, to deal with uh, and the dno insurance also protects uh, you know the fee uh, the litigation fee also so Putting all this together, it's important uh, and it's something a director should give a lot of weightage to and, you know, and read through. But having said that, it's not, it doesn't compensate for a, a strong governance mechanism. Yeah. And, and you right. asked me whether, sorry, just last thing I remember that you also asked me whether it pulls people, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, yeah, so it does. I mean, you know, uh, the, when I was looking at considering Infosys, I think the fact that Infosys has such a great reputation made a big difference. But anyone's instant reaction, like mine, was also to go and see who's on the board, you know, and having people like who we have on the board makes a big difference, right? And who's on the management, who's the management committee, where have they come from? What is the reputation that they have? I think all of that makes a difference uh, and it does uh, pull in um, uh, good people. Uh, if you have your credibility intact and your governance, uh, you know, and the faith of the, of the stakeholders intact, yeah. 
but I totally get it. Huh? It doesn't make up for good governance. Huh? It's a it's a safety net. Yes, yes, it's a safety net. It's a, it's a, it's an important to have. I would say it's it's more than just a safety net. It's important to have. But uh, you, why go down that path? I mean, if you can just uh, you know keep your governance intact, you can't stop. Look, it's a safety net because you can't. While you can have great governance, you can't stop somebody else from claiming that they're not good. Uh, or, or litigating against something. So keeping all that in mind, I think it's important, yeah. Of course, no, really appreciate it. And uh, Harsh, my last question to you is that, uh, apart from these very large, very well-recognized large listed companies, what is your suggestion when firms are looking to go public on disclosures or some form of IPO or DNO insurance, uh, coverage for shareholders, selling shareholders, coverage for book builders, um, any last piece of advice for our audience today? Mute. Harsh, harsh on mute, huh? I get a dollar more. <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go. Uh, apologies, I had a glitch in my signal earlier. Uh, let me speak to this in a little more general level. Uh, to be honest, I'm not an IPO lawyer, so I don't want to uh, be be uh, shooting off my mouth on the IPO process, uh, but uh, let me comment from the perspective of uh, governance, uh, where which is which of course something that's common to all kinds of companies at all stages of their life cycle. Uh, and secondly, on the M and A context, where I think insurance is increasingly playing a role. Uh, I think enough has been and I said on the DNO side, so I won't re won't repeat, but all of that was pretty important. Uh, I think uh, insur insurance is sort of goes hand in hand with risk, uh, and whether it's legal services or it's insurance, it's really about managing risk because sometimes the pain is in the process, yeah, and not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily the outcome alone that provides solace to people, it's the process. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, it's getting another check or sense. And for instance, in the MA context, when you get warranty insurance, it's getting up, it besides the fact that the insurer is putting money behind the product, uh, it's also another set of eyes uh, and another check on, on the risks associated with what you're doing. Uh, and I think that is also uh, valuable to have some, but because of course due diligence is important. Uh, and I think much has been said on you know partnering with the right part people and having the right business, and those are of course central. But uh, it's it it's also is comforting to know someone is putting more money behind this besides the primary party, right? and that's where the insurer comes in. So, from that perspective as well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, insurance is an enabler. I think it will increase even for smaller companies who undergo change of control transactions or who have directors and officers. Uh, any company, governance is important for any company and risk is common to all companies. So, uh, I th my advice to, I guess, any company at any stage is that obviously, you may not be in the same position as a large listed company, but you could be one day. Uh, or you may have investors who are also exposed to large listed companies and have similar standards. Uh, or it, it's about risk. Uh, you know, how do you uh, set yourself up so you are avoiding, uh, you know, risks which you really should not be taking. So I think that's that's where I would leave this. Thank you, Harsh. And, uh... I'm just conscious of the time. It's quarter past five, close close to quarter past five. So, Anuradhaji, any any thoughts from your side before we open the floor for question and answers? Well, thank you, Anup. I think it was very interesting discussion. I've taken quite a few notes. It's really interesting to see how ESG as a concept is coming up. You know, apart from the financial. Uh, Figures and statements and documents that investors look at, look at have been traditionally looking at. Now globally, ESG has 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 come out as an important parameter to look at for investors. So the discussion has been nice. We can take questions now from the floor. 
Absolutely. I would encourage uh, our audience to use the chat function actively. If there are any questions, we, please do raise your hand. We'll be happy to unmute lines. Okay, no, no questions thus far and I'm conscious this event is also being live streamed. Uh, I was told to, you know, share on behalf of the speakers that these are all their personal opinions, not their company opinions. So I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that, but, uh, you have our coordinates. If there are no questions right now, live, we're happy to, you know, take some of these things offline. Please do email us, uh, use the CII platform as well. Good. Uh, so I don't think so that, you know, uh, we are, we are getting any more uh, queries right now, but I think we've covered a very vast array of, you know, things right from China plus one and the stars aligning together for our uh, century. Uh, all goes well. Amen. And second is that, you know, what do investors look at? What is the secret sauce for some of the best managed companies in the, in the, in the country, um, as well as, you know, what to look for when you're out, you know, from an ESG perspective, from a disclosure perspective, uh, raising of funds perspective, and, uh, you know, when things go wrong, there's a safety net. And I look at this thing, not just as, as a safety net, as insurance, but more like, you know, brakes in a car, huh? the brakes in the car, make you go faster, not slower. So, so with that, uh, it's a wrap and really, really appreciate. Thank you. And ji for this platform. Uh, thank you, Sana, sir. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Alok, for your time and uh, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.